So the first question we are going to deal with today is a question that I've received from over two dozen people in the last 10 days, and that is um, help, some version of help. I am midway through collecting the data for my grants impact analysis, and I've had to stop all data collection due to the coronavirus pandemic or some version of that. Um, it's not always a grant, it's not always an impact analysis, but um, in the same way that the coronavirus pandemic is affecting all industries, it's absolutely affecting the data industry. Um, whether you're in the social sector and you're collecting data uh, to understand your projects or whether you're in the corporate sector and you're collecting data to understand um, what your customers need. Um, nothing that I have found anyway is the same anymore about data collection. Um, benchmarks no longer apply because everybody who's answering your, your benchmarkable questions um, don't live in the same world anymore, at least not for right now. Um, and of course, many, many different forms of data collection uh, aren't available to us anymore. So because I've been, um, I've been working around the globe for um, a long time now, <laughs> going on two, two decades. And so we've had some experience uh, working with people uh, to understand and salvage data in a unusual setting, a crisis setting. Um, and two recent ones is we worked with a number of different foundations uh, during and after the earthquake in Haiti, where all the data collection um, stopped and had to change, and we had to figure out how not to lose the data that we had collected before. Um, and the second example, or that's recent in my experience, is we were on the ground working in Bangladesh during the Hart Halls. And again, that was, um, everything just came to a screeching halt and all the research that we were doing, all the data collecting we were doing to help um, at that point, poor people figure out how to um, get higher prices for their milk from their cows in rural Bangladesh. Um, also it pretty much had to come to a halt. So um, we have a lot of experience being on the ground in disasters and trying to help people salvage their data. So I've put together kind of some of our best practices and I will walk you through the best practices that I can think of. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, we'll put this list up. People can add their own best practices and ideas. Um, and so as I walk through some of my ideas, feel free to ask questions in the comments section and I will do my best to keep an eye on that and um, re respond to your questions in real time. Okay, so when you've encountered a major disruption in your data project, uh, such as the coronavirus, um, a, a hard haul, an earthquake, there are, um, a cup, th basically three key things that you need to think about to kind of help you figure out what to do next. The first is how is your research question holding up? The second is what stage is your data collection in? And the third is are your analysis plans still appropriate? And even if they're appropriate, are they feasible? One of the things that I have found a lot in, in kind of crisis situations is that um, some people get a lot of comfort in having kind of some steps to follow. And so I think these are three pretty solid kind of steps to think about. And when you can answer these questions, um, we can help you figure out what to do next. How is your research question holding up is kind of the most abstract question. So it, it's maybe not the best one to start with. I'm starting with it because it's kind of in the order of operations for this presentation or this data amnesty session, but um, it's probably best to start with your data collection. But we're going to say, how's your research question holding up? Every data project, whether it's um, Capital One trying to decide uh, how, what's the best login sequence for their new app, or um, Oxfam trying to understand how to do the most ethical monitoring and evaluation from a feminist perspective in um, Haiti, or whether it's um, 
the government of Ontario trying to collect data to understand how resettlement of refugees can be done most successfully. Any data project has a research question, whether it's been identified as a research question or not, there's a reason that there's some piece of knowledge or information you're trying to get. In a crisis or a disaster situation, um, or just even a sudden change, in your environment, um, the research question has to be reconsidered. So if you were, for most people that came to me this week and last week, we're talking about impact evaluations. So um, impact evaluations, if you're not familiar with that, are basically projects that are designed to try and figure out um, whether or not a treatment or a project or a policy is having an impact or having an effect. So impact evaluations are, are for example, um, did a new kind of access to um, housing support actually reduce the number of homelessness people, homeless people in our city? Uh, another very <laughs> relevant impact analysis is does this drug work? So an impact analysis is when you're trying to find out if something has an impact or a measurable effect on um, the thing that you're trying to have an effect on. So um, if you were in the process of conducting an impact evaluation on a certain outcome, so say maybe um, a reduction in the number of people experiencing homelessness or an increase in the number of liters of milk your cows in rural Bangladesh are producing, in addition to trying to understand that, you might have to look at using your data to understand what your impact or effect is on what's actually happening. Um, that is one thing that we did in Bangladesh. We had been studying exactly what I was talking about, um, how the projects that we were, the learning centers and the projects that we were running, how were they helping to increase the amount of milk that was being produced by the cows and how were they impacting the um, women's ability to sell that milk at a fair and reasonable price. When the Hartal started, uh, they had basically the same effect on Bangladesh that this crisis is having and that nobody was allowed to move around outside. And so in Bangladesh, which is a very hot country, um, if you don't get milk from a cow to some form of refrigeration in a specific number of hours, that milk is, is spoiled. And so we were no longer really looking only at the impact of how our learning groups were able to get more milk from their cows and get a good amount of money for that milk. But suddenly we were able to just buy the the Hartals able to see if our project had an impact on the ability of groups of women farmers to work together to figure out a way to get their milk to the market. Um, so that's a practical example of how our research question had to pivot in order to actually do something that we could never have designed um, to do. And it, was, it gave us some very good insight into what was actually happening. Second thing you might have to do for your research question is add an analysis of the process. So if you're not going to be able to analyze outcomes or outputs, you may instead be able to analyze the process. So what is actually happening and how is it happening before the crisis and after the crisis? Thirdly, um, this is a very practical suggestion, simply look, at, look, sit down, look at the data you have, and, and ask yourself, what is the most interesting question that is emerging? So if you didn't have a research question, if your funder or your um, CEO, if you're in a corporation said, forget about the research questions that we have, given the data that we have in this new situation that we're in, what is actually the most interesting question that our data can answer? We have found that to be very effective. So after you've thought about your research question, probably the biggest nuts and bolts thing is what am I gonna do about my data? Uh, I was in the middle of collecting data or I really need data, um, what am I going to do? Collecting data is not cheap or easy 
um, or something somebody does just for fun. <laughs> Collecting data costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of heart, and you want to salvage as much of that data as you can so you can get as much useful information as possible, in, especially in a time of crisis. So there's basically four stages that your data collection might be in right now. Your data, collection, your data might be collected and complete, that's the blue line. Uh, your data could be mostly connect, collected, but not quite. Your data could be partially collected, or your data collection hasn't started. And where you are in, this, um, in these stages depends on kind of what innovations and solutions are available to you. If, um, once you figure out where you are, there's four basic things to look at around your data. Look at, can you make changes in your data collection mode or method? Can you change the data collection design? Can you change the data collection tool structure and design? And can you find other sources of data? So all is not lost, no matter what kind of stage of data collection that you find yourself in. If your data collection hasn't started yet, or you've only collected a little bit of data, but not very much, um, you can definitely do all four of these things. So if you wanna change your data collection mode, um, for example, we have a lot of people who are planning on doing door-to-door -door surveys um, or focus groups. Those things are not possible in pretty much any of the world right now. And you're gonna to have to change the mode or the method that you're using for data collection. So you can, there's a lot of um, very lightweight, sometimes even free, depending on what sector you're in, text message data collection. Um, it actually is one of my new favorite ways to collect data because it's, it's almost like a qualitative interaction um, rather than a simply um, quantitative multiple choice fill in the blanks kind of thing um, because people are chatting on their phones. So you can actually pre-program text message data collection. Second option is you can switch to totally online data collection. There are many, many um, paid services like Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, Pollfish, there's tons. That can be entirely mobile if most of the people that you're collecting data from aren't uh, on laptops or online. Many of them often will have mobile phones. Phone data collection, so this is, this is back to the old days. <laughs> This is back to the old days when we used to call people up and ask them questions. Um, I don't know if you follow um, John Lovett uh, from Crooked Media, but right now, he if anybody texts him, he phones them back because he thinks that uh, saying connected by the phone is really important during social is isolation. So it may actually be um, a, a twofer if you do some phone data collection. Um, you could actually be getting really nice, high quality data and um, helping somebody stay socially uh, connected. Google Forms is a great way to collect data online for free. It does not cost money and um, you do definitely need to check carefully um, the data storage policies depending on what sector you're in. Um, but it's very easy to use. Amazon Turk is the last thing I'm gonna mention. Amazon Turk is a little bit controversial. Amazon Turk is like a marketplace uh, where a lot of researchers collect a lot of data really quickly. You can, you can put surveys. Amazon Turk is basically a, a large uh, cloud-based workforce where you can um, put out jobs and people can accept the jobs or not. It's controversial because a lot of people pay very, very little for their jobs. And so um, workers are often not making even close to a minimum wage. However, that's not, um, that's not a requirement to use Amazon Turk. You can certainly offer um, a fair and reasonable compensation for people to spend their time taking your surveys. So some new data collection modes, if you were planning on doing focus groups or door-to-door um, -door surveys. The second thing you're going to have to think about is your data collection design. 
So you might have been hoping to do an RCT, you might have been hoping to do, um, sorry, an RCT is a randomized control trial, which is um, a very specific formal design where people are randomly sorted either into different parts of your sample or out of your sample. Um, doing an RCT is probably no longer possible at all right now. Um, but certainly not possible for, for most, most data projects. Um, and even the kind of traditional kinds of ways that you get people into your data collection pot, whether that's a focus group pot, um, a user experience design pot, a survey pot, even an online survey pot, um, all of those methods will be different now. And so there's two things that um, often get forgotten, but have been very useful in, we've used them in uh, crisis times. So we've used them for AIDS sampling and HIV work. We've used them for um, employment violation work, things like that. And the first is called snowball sampling, which is you get one person to provide some data to you, and then you ask that person to refer you to another person. And then slowly by slowly, you get a snowball if you're not from a, a snow a snow bearing country. Um, you get um, a larger and larger sample size by kind of working your way through networks of people. Um, and because snowball sampling has been around for a long time and has been used in um, high end medical research, there's a lot of ways, a lot of established, accepted methods for analyzing samples that have been obtained through snowball sampling. And the next is incentivized sampling. So um, incentivized sampling has a different reputation in different parts of the world and in different parts of um, different industries. But incentivized sampling is where you offer an incentive for somebody to give you their data, whether it's actual just cash or sometimes a gift card. And um, I've written quite a lot about incentivized sampling, which you can find uh, on my uh, on the wheelcount.com website, because I am a huge fan of incentivized sampling. And um, uh, at a time like now, or in any kind of a crisis, um, incentivizing your sampling will greatly improve your response rate, which will improve the types of results that you can generate. Uh, okay. So also if your data collection hasn't started or you only have a little bit of data, now's a great time to reconsider your data collection tool. If you have a survey that's gonna take somebody 45 minutes to complete, um, this is not the time for that. <laughs> so you need to reduce the number of questions and as well change the type of questions. So in a disaster or crisis situation, you don't wanna be asking questions about um, like how, um, most of the time I should say, you don't wanna be asking um, questions that are abstract or how people think they're gonna do something in the future. Um, you wanna ask very grounded, very in the moment, um, very specific questions like how are you doing something now? Or how did you do something last month? How did you do it now? Um, even if you're doing kind of um, psychometrics, like even if you're trying to understand somebody's state of mind, it's usually better to ask something very grounded, um, ask something as an example rather than as a theory, especially during times of crises when people's emotions um, can vary quite widely. Okay, last part of the data collection hasn't started. Um, you might consider finding other sources of data. So there's a lot of open data. There is data that can be purchased, which if you are no longer spending money on data collection, it might be um, possible where it wasn't possible before to purchase some data, collaborate with data. So um, if there are a lot of people working on um, understanding how food delivery e-commerce is working around the world, you can collaborate with them because they're gonna need your data just as much as you're gonna need theirs. Uh, scrounge data. <laughs> so that, that is one of my favorite ways to get data. Lots and lots of organizations, companies, and um, governments leave a ton of data um, on the table. So they'll collect data for certain purposes, they'll use it for that purpose, and then they'll leave it. That data still probably contains tons of good insights. Now I am not saying um, take data um, from anywhere and use it for anything. 
But if the motivation of the data collection is in alignment with your current needs, um, it is perfectly fine to get all of the information you can out of that data. Lastly is ambient data. Again, I've written a lot about ambient data if you want to um, look it up on some of the past blog posts. But ambient data is basically data that's being created by accident um, that, that you are already going to have. And with a little bit of ingenuity, you can get a lot of information out of it. Okay. Now on to the next situation, which is I think what most people who are writing to me are freaking out about. And that's your data is mostly collected, but it's not completely collected. And you either have to stop collecting it at all, or um, you are um, not gonna be able to complete your data collection in the way that you thought. The number one thing to do is um, change your data collection mode. And I cannot emphasize this enough, keep track of which is which. <laughs> so if you've been collecting data through um, knocking on doors or um, having focus groups or things like that, you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. And so you probably need to switch and try and finish up your data with one of the alternate modes we talked about uh, just a minute ago, like text collection, um, Google Forms, calling people. And it's really, really important and easy to forget when you're in a time of crisis that you need to keep careful track of which data came from which collection mode. Um, that's how later when you get to the analysis, you're gonna be able to control, because of course how you collect data influences the results of the data. So you'll need to control later in the analysis part which data was collected in which way. Um, also, consider changing your tool. Um, if you're almost done collecting data and you've been using that 45 minute sur survey, um, you're gonna have to reduce it and you're gonna have to reduce it down to only the most essential data. And that is okay. Again, as long as you keep track in your data collection, which data is coming through which survey or which source, you're gonna be able to control for that in your analysis and change the data collection design. So if you thought you were running an RCT or you thought you were doing fancy sampling from certain types of people, uh, you're probably gonna have to decrease that because that's not possible anymore. And instead change your focus on collecting the last bit of the most important sample. This is a great time to run a flash analysis of your existing data and see what information you still need the most. So for example, if you run a flash analysis and you find out that um, like if, if you're um, doing work on, um, let's just go back to Bangladesh when we were doing work on understanding how women were working together to get the most milk out of their cows, and all of a sudden we couldn't collect any more data, we did a flash analysis, found out that there were certain districts that we were um, lower on data in than other districts. And instead of continuing to try and collect all the data from all the districts, we stopped collecting any data at all from the districts that we had a lot of data from. And we focused on getting that last bit of data from those couple of um, last districts that were underrepresented. The same could be true of certain um, variables. If you run a flash analysis on your existing data and find out that something like, let's say, um, the, um, the breed of cow or the level of maternal education seem to be really, really important predictors in your data analysis. And you have to drop almost all of your survey questions, keep in those two. A flash analysis of existing data will help you understand who you need to collect data from. And if you need to you know, cut out 75% of your data tool, which 25% to keep. If your data is completely collected, um, you're in reasonably good shape, but it's very, very important that you go back into your data and that you record all the specific time, date, and geography in as much detail as possible for every single data point. And that's because um, you don't know yet um, when the effects of whatever crisis you're in actually started to have an effect on um, your data. And if you know, as much detail, nuance as possible for each data point, you'll be able to adjust for that in your analysis. And maybe you'll be able to find um, 
some interesting, um, you know, crisis preparation results as well. Okay, last part, and then we'll move to the next question. But the last part on help, how do I salvage my data in a crisis, is are your analysis plans still appropriate and feasible? There are many issues that you are likely to face. I have not covered them all here. <laughs> this was just um, some in a brainstorm with some uh, projects that are being disrupted right now. Uh, your data sample size might end up being smaller than you had hoped. Your sample is almost certainly not gonna be representative anymore. Your data sample might not even include an end line. So an end line is um, sometimes projects collect data at the beginning of the project and at the end of the project to see if there's any difference from the beginning to the end. Some projects have collected very expensive, very good baseline data, but are now worried that they're not gonna get any end line data. Or some people use the words pre and post. You might have pre data, but no post data. The sample was not collected when we thought it would be. We thought we were gonna do our data collection um, over three months. We did it over three weeks. Uh, the sample size is good still, but we had to reduce the number of questions. That's on this slide twice. And at the unexpected event has made your impact seem less important. So all these kind of issues have to do with what you're gonna do with your analysis plan. Uh, if your data sample size is too small or smaller than you're expecting, there are specialized analysis techniques that you can use. Um, maybe next week or in a subsequent week or in a blog post, I'll actually detail the various which specific analysis technique you should use. Um, but there are statistical methods that are designed to deal with small samples. Um, some of it, it depends if you're using geography, you could um, look up something called small area estimation. And small area estimation can be used with not just geography, those techniques can be used in other small sample situations. Um, you can combine it with other data. So it is possible to take your data and combine with other sources to get your sample size up to um, a big enough sample size. There's a statistician in Ohio named Eloise Kazar who works on that. So you could look her up. Her work is very academic, but we could definitely have a data amnesty session where we, where we talk about how to deal with a small sample size. Your sample is not representative. So yeah, your RCT is probably over. <laughs> so if you were running an RCT, which is again, a randomized control trial, which is a fancy, very specific way of setting up a data project um, that is over. <laughs> You're gonna have to use methods designed for causal analysis with observational data. So causal analysis is looking for what, what might have caused one thing to happen. Observational data is data that you collected in a non-randomized way. Um, again, we can have a whole hour on that <laughs> or even a whole day on that. Um, I write about that a lot on my blogs too. Um, so your sample is probably not gonna be representative. Uh, your sample does not include an end line is probably the hardest situation that I have faced in the last two weeks. Um, there's no post for your pre and post. Um, you are gonna have to be very, very creative at this point. Um, you can look into something called meta-analysis. Um, which is like a way to combine a whole bunch of different types of research and that might help you get an idea of where your data might have been going. You may have to adjust your research question <laughs> and you can also try something called um, simulations, which is a way you can use a computer to take some of your data and kind of pretend that you got the end line data. Um, it won't exactly answer your research question, but it might give you a, a better idea than simply throwing all your data away. So none of these are as good as having all your data, of course, having all your data is better, um, but these are better than just throwing all your data away. Um, the sample was not collected when we thought it would be. So if you're collecting data over time and it, the time is not when you thought it would be. There's a very specific method called longitudinal mixed effects models, which can handle what's technically called unbalanced data. So that is data that is um, not collected at the time you thought it would be, or not all collected at the same time. 
and oh good i want to wrap this up now and take your questions the sample size is good but we had to reduce the questions so that means you're going to have less data um this is probably the least traumatic of the questions <laughs> um if your sample size is still good you can still probably do most of the analysis but if you don't have all the questions that you were hoping to include in your analysis, so all the variables. Try um, Bayesian analysis, which can help you get information from fewer questions. And a really practical suggestion around Bayesian analysis is um, Judea Pearl is in, uh, he's a scientist in California, and he has a very approachable book called The Book of Why. And he can walk you through how to make some diagrams which will help you get some answers from less questions. Um, the unexpected event has made your impact less important. I don't know if there's a data <laughs> issue around this, um, but it's more that's more of a conceptual question. And um, we I don't think in the middle of this particular crisis, I should, <laughs> I should opine about that. But um, that, that is probably likely to happen. And if you find an impact that now feels more important and you have data on that, then I would say go ahead and analyze the data on what you think is the more important impact. This is where um, you can find me. I'm not, I'm not gonna um, sign off yet because I have one or two questions that were just coming in that I'm gonna answer. But um, if you've only tuned in for the um, how to salvage your data in a disaster, um, this is where you can, weallcount.com is where you can find the blog posts that I was talking about, where you can also find the links to the videos from past and present um, data analyses. And if you want to send me a question in advance, you can either email it to Heather at iDataSyst or tweet it to me at DataSyst.